Welcome to our biweekly advocacy chat for local officials. Um, we're glad to see you here today. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, I, I just wanted to note that this is primarily a, a chat for local officials and we're happy to take questions from you. And if there is time after that, and there are folks who are not from local government, we'd be happy to take those questions. Uh, my name's Karen Horn, Director of Public Policy. And with me this morning is Gwen Zakov, our Municipal Policy Advocate. And Lisa Goodell is going to keep things rolling smoothly in the background. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping notes. Everybody is muted to start. Gwen and I will cover issues from last week's legislative session and uh, give you a heads up for a few things that are happening early in the week, starting tomorrow. And then we look forward to having a discussion after that. Please unmute yourself or raise a hand to speak. You're all muted to start. Uh, we'll also monitor the chat for questions if you'd prefer to put a question in the chat. And we look forward to having a really robust conversation. As I said, there's an awful lot happening right now. The other thing we wanted to mention again is that you may follow legislative action at the website legislature.vermont.gov. And if you go to the individual committee pages, on the top of their agenda, you will see the link to uh, YouTube where you can watch what they're talking about at any time that they're in session. With that, we're going to get started and Gwyn is going to lead off today. Good late morning, everybody. Um, nice to see everyone this Monday. Um, sun's out, feeling pretty good after a great weekend. Hope everyone enjoyed themselves. Um, so I'm going to do a couple subject matters, but I'm spending majority of my time on the transportation bill and transportation funding. Um, the folks that uh, had the opportunity to read our weekly legislative report from Friday got a pretty good synopsis, but if you are looking for um, some more specific information with links to some of the budget um, uh, spreadsheets. I encourage you to go to Friday's legislative report on our website to um, peruse the article um, that I wrote. So, but if you want the uh, short version um, where I hit the highlights, I'll, I'll walk you through it right now. Um, so last week was uh, week 910 of the legislature. The House Government Operations Committee always takes the first shot at the transportation bill. Um, it gets wrapped up into, well, not the bill itself, but the, a lot of the funding um, gets wrapped up into um, the overall budget, big budget bill. So they kind of go in correlation with each other, although the timing's not, you know, exactly the same, but it, they're, you know, go hand in hand. Um, the transportation bill overall, um, the governor's recommend um, was actually really positive. Uh, it had a, a very strong showing of support for local governments and local um transportation funding the house government Oper or house transportation committee took um you know several several weeks of testimony um through the agency um and we vlct also testified um and they not only agreed with much of what the governor recommended um, but also um, added to it which made it even which actually sweetened the pot more for local government so in my five-ish years of working um, in the legislature, I think this is probably the most positive transportation bill um, and funding proposal that I have seen. So the majority of the, um, of the changes from year over year previous uh, that increased the funding to local governments were really due in part to the extension um, of the FAST Act, which is the federal um, transportation funding, um, you know, overall, you know, the, the country's budget act that gets the money sent to the states trickles down. Um, and with this new infusion of money and sort of a, a let a more um, uh, liberal interpretation of how the funding can be um, used, the agency of transportation was able to shift money around to free up money to go towards 
um, programs that don't necessarily always um, aren't necessarily always open to federal funding. Um, in this budget proposal, there was a huge shift over from what normally comes out of state funds for what is called the maintenance appropriation. Um, this is the maintenance appropriation for the entire state VTRANS budget. It's a quite it's a it's a it's quite a big line item in general, uh, but they were able to take some federal monies um, and put it into that line item that normally they wouldn't be able to, and that freed up a bunch of money to put in other sectors. So, um, so what you see there with that freeing up of money was an additional $3 million that the House Government Operations Committee is proposing to put into town um, Highway A, and this is the general town highway aid that um, where there's the formula that the state goes by to give the proportionate funding to municipalities. Additionally, um, that freeing up of money, a lot of those, uh, a lot of the money the Transportation Committee is deciding to put into has been for programs that are for sort of like um, emissions reduction programs. So you're seeing a, a, a quite a bit of money being put into um, electric vehicle incentive programs, emission um, repair programs for um, certain vehicles, um, <clears throat> even e-bike incentives and um, an expansion of um, level two electric vehicle charger stations um, into more areas of Vermont. So those are sort of the differences, the, the town highway aid and those um, emission reduction programs, those are when they shift the, shifted the money around, that's where uh, the significant freed up money went into. Now, that being said, there also was a um, increase of money. Um, I, I would say it's relatively level funding for most programs for town highway, for town highway programs, but you saw that big bump or relatively big bump, it's all relative, right? For um, general town highway aid with that additional $3 million. And then we also saw an increase of funding for town highway structures and town highway class two roadway program. So many will remember that last year, um, the grants for those programs were suspended uh, because of COVID and those um, <clears throat> monies that were supposed to be used for those programs were just um, put out as general town highway aid for that year. Um, so not only did the legislature, um, or the, at least the proposal from the House Government Operations Committee, um, bring back the funding, but they increased it on top of that. So they have um, an overall increase of, um, for town highway structures, um, <clears throat> we saw um, an increase, let me just pull up the document real quick, sorry. Um, an increase of 100, basically 172.4% increase over the year over last. And for town highway class two roads, a 370% increase. So there was a huge influx of money put into that, um, those two programs. Um, there was a question earlier about um, funding for mun the municipal mitigation assistance program. So this is basically the money for the municipal um, uh, road per general road permit for the, the water infrastructure in, um, uh, on class one through four roads under the, uh, the general road permit. The funding for that um, had increased from last year, but it's a decrease from 2019. Um, although there was a huge increase in the 2019 budget that was a close, just over $9 million, it went down to $3 million <laughs> the year after. It was, so it was a $6 million loss in 2020, and it's proposed for the next year to be um, uh, a $6 million. So it went from nine to three, and it's going back up to six. Um, and then again, like I said earlier, the rest of it's relatively level funded. The other thing I wanted to point out um, with the transportation bill before I move on is that Yes, there's the increase for general town highway aid. Yes, there's the increase for structures and class two roadways. Um, the other thing that the legislate, the House Government Operations Committee is proposing is that under state statute moving forward, the proposal would be that um, under Title 19, that they increase the minimum grant award for town highway structures Right now, it's $5.8 million. They're going to increase the minimum that the state has to give local governments to $7.2 million. So we're seeing a minimum threshold that the state has to um, pony up every year from $5.8 to $7.2 million. 
Further, that's for the, the structures program. For class two, they're proposing to, to change the grant minimum under statute from 7.65 million to 8.6 million. So for both those programs, they are now um, proposing statute is increasing those minimums. And then for the class two highway program, they are now in correlation with that, they are saying that the minimum, or I'm sorry, the maximum cap for individual grants is going to be raised from um, 175,000 to 200,000. So essentially, I mean, this is not a silver bullet, it's not solving all the problems, but as everyone knows, the cost of projects has gone up, um, you know, the uh, available money has gone down. Um, this at least is a, um, a recognition that there needs to be more funding into those programs. Um, and that at least for the class two um, projects, even though a $200,000 cap is, is not, you know, it's not everything, it's at least inching it closer towards what a more realistic number would be because 175, I believe that number and Karen can correct me if I'm wrong, hasn't been updated in over 10 years. Um, so it's just <clears throat> updating that. So those are kind of the highlights. I'd encourage everyone to go to our ledge report to, to look at the my little write up and in that um, and actually I'll, in the chat box um, when I'm done talking, I'll put links to the budget kind of spreadsheets um, so you guys have um, an easy access to it. So that's the um, town um, uh, transportation funding. The second thing I wanted to bring up quickly before I hand things off to Karen, because I know you're all really excited to hear about um, the federal monies coming to the state and what that's going to look like. Um, the uh, Senate Government Operations Committee has um, had reached out to me last week and had asked that um, over the next coming weeks, we would get testimony into that committee to talk about local government. And when I asked what that meant, <laughs> I, um, I was told that that committee is really interested in hearing from local government officials to talk about local government needs, specifically as they relate to increased local autonomy and authority over municipal matters. Um, not necessarily talking about home rule, but that could be one thing, but essentially talking about the challenges that you experience working through general state statute, um, uh, general programs, um, the charter process, basically anything that you may find challenging um, as an, a municipality as it comes to um, self-governance and things that impact your communities. So I've um, heard from um, Walter Martone, who's on the um, call today from Springfield, who's volunteered to come to testify. And um, I, if you're interested in testifying in the chat, I'll put my email. Um, please email me over the next week or two, um, the sooner the better, um, and, and let me know if you'd be um, willing to testify. Um, it's really an open dialogue that the committee wants to hear. There's no subject matter off limits. You don't have to be a great public speaker. You don't have to talk about anything really exciting. You just really have to be honest and um, explain um, what some of the challenges you have um, are. And um, I think it's worth noting that there's a few charters working through the legislature right now, um, some more quote unquote controversial than others. Um, <clears throat> But there were two charters um, that there's two charters right now that are moving and, and for others that are supposedly coming up later that would have a provision in, in their charter that would allow that municipality to borrow, essentially borrow other charter provisions from other duly enacted um, charters that are already in state law. It was sort of an idea that, hey, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. If another community is allowed to have a charter provision, what would prevent another community from having that? So far, um, because most of these charters are starting in the Ho uh, House Government Operations Committee, which is generally not very supportive of local government, they have um, stripped those provisions from those charters. Williston um, and Winooski are the ones working, you know, that are going right now. Um, and they have said that that is unconstitutional. It's an unconstitutional, unconstitutional delegation of um, local authority um, or of le legislative authority to local governments. Um, that I won't get into the details of that, but that's their official um, position on that. 
Um, so that I, I bring that up only to accentuate that if um, you know if you're going to be testifying or wanting to testify in Senate government operations, um, these are sort of the limitations we're working up against. Is that like you know we all know that general uh, statutory law is really challenging sometimes to get done what you need to get done, and then even when you have a charter <laughs> and you want to get things done a little bit different, you're still told no. So. Um, I encourage everyone to reach out to me and let me know if you're interested in testifying. And that is my spiel. I'll hand things off to Karen and I will put things in the chat right now. Okay, thanks, Gwen. Um, I, I just wanna clarify that the testimony is this coming Friday, right? It is so this Friday. Well, she's starting, well, the idea is that we're starting testimony this Friday, but it would be continuing forward. Um, there's an, an, it's Friday only for like an hour or two. So um, I think there's an understanding that we're not gonna get everybody in today. So there would be um, more testimony coming later. Okay, so this really is a unique opportunity in, in really most of the time that I've been here also for, the, for a committee to say, come in and talk about whatever your kind of governance needs are and we'll try to take them up. So I, I urge you to, to join that conversation. I wanted to talk about a few bills, just mention a few bills that are uh, moving now. The first is H159, which is the Better Places program came out of the House Commerce Committee. And that has um, a new Better Places program in it, funding for that. It has expansion of the downtown tax credits to new neighborhoods and also an increase in the amount of tax credits that's available. Uh, and it has a, a number of other provisions, funding for the tourism and marketing department of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and uh, economic development, economic recovery, I should say, grant money for for local businesses and towns. So that's a bill we want to keep track of and we're very supportive of. H-152 is the education property tax yield bill. Every year, the Ways and Means Committee has to put together this bill and, and uh, set the, the non-residential and residential property tax rates as well as the uh, income-based property tax, well, the income-based education fund rate for the state. And the takeaway here is that essentially um, there are no changes from last year. So there is no increase. And uh, that's a really good thing. Uh, I think it's certainly due to the fact that there, there is so much federal money coming into the state that they can manage to do that this year as well as the fact that our sales tax revenues in particular are up quite a bit higher than was expected in any of the projections over the last year. So that's a bill that we need to keep track of. I don't think that it will change much as it goes through the process. And then the other bill that I just wanted to mention is H360, and that's the community broadband bill it's been to a number of committees on the House side, and now it's on the calendar um, for tomorrow. So they will have all those reports from appropriations, ways and means, and um, government operations, I believe, and the original committee, energy and technology. And that's gonna provide significant funding for, um, for uh, community broadband emphasis on uh, communications union districts. And then the one, the other one that we need to mention is H315. And that is the bill that is up for third reading in the Senate tomorrow. It's been through the House already. The Senate Appropriations Committee put in a, quite a few amendments. And uh, two of them are that they would provide funding to the Vermont League of Cities and Towns in the amount of $650,000 to stand up a program that will help towns negotiate the requirements of the spending the money that they get from the uh, American Rescue Plan. And that's gonna be a big job. Uh, we, I was reading over the weekend questions from state budget 
officials across the state, across the country, there are hundreds of questions. So you're dealing with the federal government. It's a new program. Guidance is going to be coming from Treasury. And uh, we think that that this program at VLCT will, um, well, we expect that it will be very helpful to you as you negotiate all of that. Um, there's also 300,000 in that bill for regional planning commissions to help you with project management if you decide to undertake something like an infrastructure project um, with that funding. So moving to the American Rescue Plan, uh, if you read the newsletter this week, there is a lot of money coming to the state and there is a lot of money coming to local governments. The um, city of Burlington, because it is what's called a metro city or the equivalent of, is getting $19 million in direct local aid and local governments other than um, the city of Burlington are getting $57.4 million distributed as local aid to cities and towns and villages. There's also a big pot of county government money, $121 million. And across the country, as you know, uh, county governments are general units of government not so much here in New England and really not at all in Vermont. So the congressional delegation and ultimately the US Department of Treasury is making the determination that that $121 million will also be distributed to cities, towns and villages based on the proportional amount of population that is in that county. So um, your, uh, your going to be receiving a, a considerable amount of money uh, to, to spend on a number of different issues, including uh, replacing lost revenue, not apparently um, at this point in time, uh, replacing revenue that you might have lost because you reduced property taxes. But I think there's a lot more to come on that discussion because it's a big issue around the country. In any case, altogether, the dollars that are coming to the local governments total $198 million. Like we have never been in this situation before. I don't need to tell you that. Um, so as I mentioned, they have to be allocated according to population. The uh, Treasury has 60 days from the date that the president signed the bill to get local to get the state and local aid to the states and half of the amount that's due to local governments will come in a first um, disbursement and then half of the amount to local governments at any rate will come at the end of this calendar year so in December of 2021. Uh, and it's all distributed based on population. We think we're working with the uh, agency of administration, Doug Farnham, who is the chief of operations there and has been working on COVID aid and the coronavirus relief funds over the past year. So uh, you may be getting eventually, I, I imagine you will, uh, an, message from the agency of administration asking you to certify what was the what was your budget as as of the year that ended January 1 2021 I believe that's the way it or 2020 excuse me and and so that's going to be a very important number for us to have accurately represented at the agency because given all the money that you are likely to receive, uh, it can't be more than 75% of that budget, the last pre-pandemic budget. So also lots more to come on that particular issue, but that is going to be um, fairly important. The other thing that I wanted to emphasize to you 
is that the American Rescue Plan is distributing um, a whole lot of money to states and it's coming in uh, specified buckets. So there is money specifically for waters, wastewater and broadband. There is money specifically for economic recovery grants, for rental assistance, for um, uh, mortgage foreclosure deferment, you know, to help people pay their mortgages and so forth, and a whole host of issues. And what we would caution you, because we know that the um, hordes are going to be on your doorstep asking for money from the towns, is that you first direct them to the state, to those various pots of money. You have until the end of 2024 to spend the dollars that are coming to you. Uh, but, um, and it's flexible, fairly flexible money re relative to some of the other pots of money that are being given to the states. So it seems to make sense that you would a, wait until we've got reliable guidance from the US Department of Treasury about how this all works, but B, that those other um, designated program funds be used before the town um, uses their funds. And that will allow everybody to sort of make the best use of the dollars going forward. Let's see. So, uh, there is, just to give sort of a summary, um, funds can be used to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency by paying for costs related to assistance to households, businesses, nonprofits, and affected industries, tourism being a big one. Again, there are funds at the state that are gonna be, that are set up to address those issues as well. Uh, you can use it for premium pay up to $13 an hour in addition to base pay up to $25,000 annually to government workers who provide essential work during the pandemic uh, to make investments in water, sewer, broadband infrastructure and to re replace lost uh, revenues. And, and as I mentioned a little bit ago, the uh, the language that they wrote around that is a tad squirrely. So we're gonna uh, have to wait for some more guidance on that. Um, let's see. And and so I, get, I guess I'll leave it there and I would ask you to really stay tuned and, and keep track of uh, any other information that, that we send out on that. And I think, we may want to turn to questions. So it looks like Paul has a question. Paul Forlenza, my eyes are not that good. No, you're doing well. Um, I'm on the select board in Lincoln. So two questions about the American Recovery Plan. Uh, one is the money that are coming to towns, I assume they're not just gonna write a check, that there's a ton of paperwork uh, that's normal with federal kinds of grants. Is that, is that, am I assuming right? Well, um, we don't actually know, but I would imagine that they're not going to just write a check. Uh, there is a certification process that towns have to quote certify. Um, we don't know what you have to certify just yet, but, um, the, the there will be some paperwork involved. The, another very important point about the American Rescue Plan is that the aid is direct to local governments. The state cannot condition that aid. That's very clear in the legislation. And so um, you're, you're going to have to address um, federal requirements, but um, not additional state requirements that are anything other than just implementing the federal guidance. Okay, um, second question is, if our year runs from July to June, what? how do we do this for um, the end of 2020? Looking at- So I, for that. I, I think that the um, year would be the one that ends 
June 30 before um, the end of okay. June. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, so just, I'm sorry. Just one more question. So if the state can't condition, uh, does that mean we don't have to wait for the legislature to go through some process? Oh, exactly. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Okay. But, that's, that's goodness. Yeah, that is good. Um, and I will just mention that the National League of Cities, who we work with in Washington, was really relentless on that point. Um, we think we have troubles here. Some other towns in other states have a lot more trouble than we do uh, in, in any case. Um, so the one other thing I wanted to mention is that the, the feds have 60 days to deliver the funds to the states. And then the states have an additional 30 days to distribute that first uh, tranche of money to the um, localities. So you're looking out a fair bit of time right now, although it's gonna go fast, but yeah. Appreciate it. Looks like Walter, oh, go ahead. Appreciate all the things you do. It's very valuable, thank you. Thank you. Walter, did you have a question? Yes, um, my question is about the um, the eligible uses. Um, you know, clearly they, as you go down the list, they all say COVID related, COVID related, et cetera. But then you get down to the water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, and it doesn't say COVID related. Does do you have any guidance or any guesses at this point that can we just like can we do a sewer project that we've had on the books? for a long time, but we never had money to do? We think that that is something that's gonna be permissible. Um, again, we're gonna to need to get more guidance, but the idea was that this would be um, in the nature of capital funding, that, so you could do those kinds of projects. You're it right, didn't... the COVID related is not attached to that section. And it didn't say anything about transportation projects or road projects. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hop in there, Malter. I think the um, uh, the that was a very that was very um, by design. The uh, Congress right now is working on a long term transportation funding bill, um, and they are planning on getting um, uh, transportation monies to states. Um, that really address a lot of the infrastructure needs that have gone fallen to the wayside over the past decade plus. Um, at least that's the plan. Um, and so they were, and the National League of Cities actually also made this clear was that, you know, towns and cities need to know that um, that was by design and that there should be money coming later that's specifically um, meant for transportation needs. So, um, they didn't want to dilute it, you know, di dilute the funding to go to something that they already knew funding was going to come later on for transportation needs. Thank you. Gwen, are there, or Lisa, are there other questions? I, I can't see everybody. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, I, I think it was already said several times, but just really reiterate what Karen was talking about in terms of this, the, the aid that's coming to local governments is that there is no rush to get money out the door. You have until 2024. We have plenty of time for everyone to get their ducks in a row. And I think another important point to make is that because of all that increased funding that's coming to the state, not just to you folks, which is why you were saying when people are knocking on your doorstep saying, hey, I want some money, say go to the state first. <laughs> Um, they got way more money to fish from um, and then come to us if you don't get anything, um, is that there's going to be cross needs that the state has highlighted that they want to spend money on and that local governments also want to spend money on. So if they're, you don't want to be putting a lot of money into something that maybe the state's going to be putting money into, you know, moving forward. And I think the biggest one there would be broadband, you know, and it's great that you can use it for broadband. And it's not that you shouldn't use your money for broadband, especially in those communities that are really trying to get their um, their CUDs up and running and, and, and um, expedite um, uh, broadband in their communities. But um, if we know that there's going to be more significant funding coming from the state and, we'll, and more details will be coming as the weeks go on right before they adjourn, um, 
and and perhaps they might be coming back over the summer from what I hear, <laughs> which is terrifying, um, to even uh, figure out more money allocations is that don't don't send money out the door too quickly and don't do it without doing your due diligence of understanding where the state's putting their money as well. Right, so the, um, Gwen's absolutely right about that. And the other thing I, I should mention is that the legislature is, the House is finalizing their budget bill. Um, and I believe it's gonna get out um, either tomorrow or, or Wednesday. They've been working all weekend on putting the finishing touches on that. So there'll be a lot more direction from the state when we can see what's um, included in, in the budget bill. And that would be the budget bill for the fiscal year that starts uh, July 1. So there'll be guidance there. Y'all are a silent bunch. We thought we'd have so many questions. <laughs> right. It is true that having a lot of money is a good problem to have, and we're sure not is. really accustomed to that at the local level. So, um, Paul first, and then Walter. Thanks. Um, switching topics away from municipalities into education. There are several education bills that would affect the threshold number, whether or not health care uh, increases are included in the, the calculation for food right. cost and whether construction is included. Do you have any sense about where those are? If right. they happen? So on H H312 is the property education property tax yield bill. Um, the bill would, I'm just reading here, add an exclusion for eligible school capital project costs that have received preliminary approval from the Agency of Education um, and would also exclude um, those from the excess spending category. So if you're in a town where your um, education or if you're in a school district where the education fund um, spending it, per pupil spending is hitting up against the limit, uh, the school <clears throat> construction costs would not kick you over into the excess spending category, which is essentially a penalty. Uh, let's see, the, um, uh, under current law, the equalized pupil count of a school district that merged voluntarily should not be less than 96.5% of the actual number of equalized pupils in the previous year. That's what the statute says. Um, but uh, school districts that did not merge voluntarily, either because they were not required to or they were required to, um, are not currently allowed to use this provision, but that hold harmless provision would be extended to all school districts for this coming year, which I think will also be significant for some of the school districts around the state. Uh, Agency of Education indicated that 14 school districts will be able to count an additional 29 equalized pupils in FY22. The other, um, item, which I'm not finding right now, but is that there are a lot of um, students who are not necessarily in school this year. And um, there is a provision that you would not be penalized because you've had a significant drop in the number of equalized pupils this year. And the, and the way that works, oh, no, the way ahead. that works is that they count on October 1, I believe that's the date they count on every year. What is the number of your equalized pupils? And that's the number that carries forward in making all these calculations in an ordinary year. Um, so you, and, and in the fall, we're in the spring now, right? It's so confusing. Anyway, in the fall, um, there were a lot of students who had opted for homeschooling or, or the little pod schooling, something outside of the public education system. So just a quick follow-up question. Uh, the issue around construction costs is that's future construction costs. If you've just finished 
a construction project and you have debt on that, I assume that's not going to be taken out, although logically it should be. I don't know the answer to that, but I can try and find out for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So if you can imagine, the reason I ask all these education questions is because in our school district, there's a proposal to eliminate three of the five elementary schools. <laughs> and right. the feeling is if a small town loses an elementary school, uh, that's the beginning of a sort of a downhill spiral, if you will. Yes, yeah, yeah. We're um, in a similar situation in my school district. And, so. and the problem is that the superintendent is not incentivized about how it's gonna affect communities. He only looks, he primarily looks at um, what, what the expenses are going to be and whether he's going to exceed the per student cost or not. Um, and, and there's nobody other than the select board to really um, be concerned about the effects uh, on the community. Right, right. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Um, before Walter hops in, I just did a dump of links in the chat box. I apologize, but those are all links to the Joint Fiscal Office's information on the American Rescue Plan. There was a question about finding information on that. Um, there's also a link to just a brief overview from the um, uh, Senator Sanders' office, although that's a little dated and it's really general. And then the last link I have is from the National League of Cities <clears throat> um, that are tracking this um, uh, uh, American Rescue Fund's monies really in the lens of local government. So that link will take you to the NLC website that's going to be continually updated as um, the treasury gets more information and is um, solidifying some of the um, the mandates in terms of how funding can and cannot be spent. So, so just one caution in, in case um, any of those links, um, Gwen, include the spreadsheet that has the allocation to local governments. You, no, I didn't one. include that. <laughs> okay, thank you. There was one two weeks ago posted and also with the congressional delegations, they had put out the same list, but that list is going to change, particularly right. if the county dollars go to local government. So um, you need to take that allocation with a significant grain of salt. Yeah, yeah the county allocation is going to completely change everything. And that's not even been close to solidified to how they're going to um, figure that out because there are obviously other you know local governments that will be vying for that money and even even not even if that's not on the table it's figuring out how to apportion the monies between states counties villages other municipal entities that are not schools so pay, we need to pace ourselves and just like you know wait for the higher ups to make some bigger decisions i mean the cares act stuff took months and months to comb through um, so it's probably going to be relatively similar here, but the expectations for doing it correctly and spending money properly is really high for local governments across the country. And, and in this legislation, um, and it'll be, and it'll be um, said again, I'm sure, as the Senate and House in our state figures out how to um, send out money is that, you know, local governments are going to be responsible for any misspent money. So, you know, that's really important for towns and cities to do it right the first time because um, you're going to be on the hook if you do things wrong. So let's all pace ourselves. <laughs> um, one other comment just in response to Scott's uh, question in the chat about Congressman Welch's inquiry regarding um, projects that you have. That is as a result of um, Congress being allowed to do some limited earmarks this session in their um, budget and I believe transportation bills also. So that's what that inquiry is about. I don't know how they are going to um, uh, evaluate any request that comes in for an earmark from, from towns or, or the state uh, because I imagine you're not gonna be doing all of them, but, but that is what that's referring to. I think Walter had a question. Sorry, Walter. <laughs> uh, yes, um, my question is uh, going back to the categories under the uh, for municipalities under the American Res Rescue Plan. In the bill, it didn't say you know so much percent for this category, so much percent for that. 
So would you, would you sense then that we could take all the money and put it in one category? Like for example, you know, one big sewer project? Um, well, um, I think you could, I think you could. I, I do think that um, towns might want to look first to um, any revenue, replacing revenues that they've lost. Um, but yeah, there are not, um, there's not categories of how, of how much money you need to spend in each uh, bucket, I guess. Yeah, so. the revenue, the revenue replacement thing, I mean, it's, you know, I, I know it'd be like fees and things like that, that we couldn't collect would probably be pretty minimal um, because we continue to operate like we normally would. And, you know, people still mm -hmm. bought their dog licenses and things like that. And as far as property tax, um, I think you said that we probably can't use it for replacing property tax. But well, you know, if you if if you reduced your property tax rate in order to help people, I think that is the questionable item. But okay. if you had delinquencies, I think you could clearly replace those dollars if you okay. wanted to. I would assume, though, that our delinquencies would have to be higher than what they would be in in the typical year when we yes. collect it. Yeah. Because we actually turned out to be pretty good. People paid their taxes. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask is that you put a lot of links in that chat box there. Is there a way? Do you know if there's a way to like print it out or something? Because I can't write them all down probably before this session is over. And then one final thing is, you, uh, Karen, you mentioned a link at the very beginning, I think, of this of the session for following committee actions and things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you give us that link also? I tried yeah. to write it down, but I didn't get it all. That is just that's, it's leg that's all my leg questions. Yeah, legislature dot Vermont spelled out Vermont dot gov. Um, and maybe Lisa can tell us if you can print out the chat or if that'll be available after. Yeah, so I'll post all of these links. We post the recordings of these as well. So I'll post the links on that site. If you just go to our website, it'll be right under the news section with today's date. If I could just make a suggestion, if you click on those links now, it'll bring it up in a different window in your browser, all three. And so you'll have it if you click on those before the session is over. Thanks, Paul. Um, there was a question from Scott Murphy, <clears throat> um, and I'm not entirely sure what the question is. There was an odd detail, but it says, do you have any information on the funding for projects Peter Welch is asking for with the deadline of March 31st? Yeah, that's the earmark question. That's the earmark one? Okay, that's what I figured, but I just wanted to make yeah. sure it wasn't tied to anything else great yeah. any other questions about anything we have a little bit of time if anyone's interested wow okay all right well lots more to come and thank you for joining us and uh keep track of the weekly legislative updates at least in the um, near term that's where i think most of this information will show up Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a good week. Bye.